All right. Hello. Um, welcome, everyone, to the University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law. We are extremely happy to see you here today and to see so mem many members of the law school and university community here. So thank you all for coming and joining uh, to hear this great talk about an issue that is incredibly important in our society today. So we're very pleased tonight to welcome our authors, Professors Angela Davis, uh, Christine Henning, and our own Renee McDonald Hutchins to discuss their book, Policing the Black Man, Arrest, Prosecution, and Imprisonment. Those of you who know me know that I made a promise when I became dean to read all the books that were written by faculty members. Um, and so this was uh, a reminder to me that I needed to finish this one. Um, and I do want to just take a moment to reflect, if you haven't read the book, um, it is an incredibly powerful book. And I think it's really powerful for people like me, um, who are not people who suffer these kinds of injustices, but who are very sympathetic to the law that surrounds people who are. Um, and the book, over and over again, over and over again, really talks about these kinds of slights, the way that the law sets up to really put um, black men in a different position than the rest of us. So I really encourage you to, to read the book, but also to think about the ways in which it informs us as policymakers, as future leaders, um, to understand how other people may be experiencing justice in a way that for others of us, uh, it's just not the way it's experienced. So that's a little bit of a detour, but I did want to um, really say how moving the book was to me when I read it and to thank the authors for, for what they uh, were able to share. Um, I think that, you know, unless you've been living on another planet or another country, you've been seeing what's been happening in America with regard to African American men. Um, we have a long history in this country, but in the past few years, we've um, continued to see really disconcerting incidences involving especially police and black citizens. Names like Michael Brown, Freddie Gray, and most recently, Stephon Clark come to mind uh, as we're thinking about these issues. And they're just a few of the names on what would be a very long list of people whose lives have been taken in what appears to be a growing ep academic, epidemic. But we have really a deeper story here, and one we're lucky to have several experts with us to share their insights. The book, Exploring the Black Man, explores social, psychological law, and policy perspectives on the way that police interact with black males from childhood to adulthood. We have a lot to learn from our experts, and after the talk, I hope you will join us in the atrium for light refreshments and an opportunity to purchase the book and have it signed by them. For now, though, I hope you'll join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor David. Thank you, Dean Tobin, and I also want to thank, first of all, everyone for being here. It's disheartening to see so many people come out, and that says to me that you care about this issue. So thank you for being here. I also want to thank Russell McLean and my dear colleague, friend, and co-author, Renee Hutchins, for, for having me today and making this event possible. Um, a few years ago, I was approached by the publishers of this book and asked if I would be interested in editing a volume of essays that would attempt to contextualize and explore all of the horrible killings of black men and boys in recent years. And of course, these killings have been going on since the time of slavery, but in recent years, they've come more to our attention, quite frankly, because of cell phone cameras and social media, but they've been going on since the time of slavery. And when I was asked if I wanted to participate in this project, I immediately said yes, because there's no issue more important to me than the unfair treatment of black and brown people in the criminal justice system at every step of the process from arrest through sentencing. So when I thought about who I would ask to join me, I thought about the authors, writers, scholars, activists, lawyers, 
activist agitators who've been writing, teaching, thinking about this issue, litigating, and in many instances, living this issue. And I reached out to them and was very fortunate that so many of them said yes. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the contributing authors to the book. And I especially want to thank the two contributing authors who are here with me today, Renee Hutchins and Kristen Henning. Um, and I just want to take a minute to say something about each of them. Uh, so Professor Kristen Henning, who is to your left, wave. she'll wave, <laughs> is the Agnes N. Williams Research Professor of Law and Director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and the Associate Dean for Clinics and Centers at Georgetown Law School. Her scholarship has appeared in many journals, including the Cornell Law Review, California Law Review, and NYU Law Review, and in books such as Punishment and Popular Culture. And I'm happy to say that she's currently writing a book on the criminalization of black adolescents, which is much of what her chapter in the book is about. The other person I don't really need to introduce, but I will anyway, uh, you all know Professor Renee McDonald Hutchins. She's a co-director of the Clinical Law Program and the Jacob A. France Professor of Public Interest Law here at the University of Maryland, Carey School of Law. She's the author of several scholarly works, including two books, Learning Criminal Procedure and Developing Professional Skills, Criminal Procedure, and also, as I said, the author of one of the essays um, in, in the book. And so we'll all have an opportunity to speak to you tonight about our own particular chapters, and then we'll open it up to discuss this topic with you. But I thought I would start out by reading a brief excerpt from the book's introduction. So as I mentioned, I'm the editor of the book, so I wrote the introduction and I'm the editor, but I also contributed a chapter to the book. So I'd like to read a brief excerpt from the introduction because I think it will give you a sense of what the book is about. Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Sam DuBose, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, and Terrence Crutcher are just some of the names on a long list of unarmed black boys and men who were killed by police officers in recent years. Although black men have been the victims of violence at the hands of the state since the time of slavery, technology and social media now permit us to literally bear witness to many of these killings repeatedly. Millions of people have watched the video of a police officer choking Eric Garner to death as he struggled for air. Similarly, millions have watched the video of a police officer shooting Walter Scott in the back as he ran for his life. Who can ever forget the grainy footage of Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old boy who was shot by a police officer while he played alone with a toy gun in a park near his home? Two videos, one from a police helicopter and another from a police dashboard camera, show Terrence Crutcher walking away from police officers with his hands raised high in the air just before he was shot and killed. These images have evoked feelings of fear, sadness, and outrage, and serve as a reminder that the lives of black men and boys continue to be devalued and destroyed with impunity at the hands of the state. To date, not one of the police officers who killed these men and boys has been convicted of a single crime. And I want to pause here. When I wrote this, uh, My Michael Slager, who killed Walter Scott uh, in North Charleston, um, had not gone to trial, and that was the challenge of this book. As we're writing it daily, black men and boys are being killed, and so, you know, when do we stop writing was the question. But some of you may now re remember that he pled guilty to a civil rights violation, but I just want to be clear that the statement I just made is, is still true. The jury did not convict him of the murder of Walter Scott. He, he ultimately pled guilty to a civil rights violations. So to date, not one of these boys and men has been convicted of their murders. From the arrival of the first slaves in Jamestown in 1619 to the lynchings of 19th and 20th centuries to the present day, black boys and men have been unlawfully killed by those who were sworn to uphold the law and by vigilantes who took the law into their own hands. The National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened its doors on September 24, 2016, includes exhibits that tell the story of many of these killings. Yet these killings are not just a part of African American history. 
They have continued well into the 21st century, almost 400 years after the beginning of slavery, and they persist with remarkable frequency and brutality during a time when America elected its first African-American president. Many of these race-based killings have inspired and reinvigorated movements for change. The brutal killing of 14-year-old Emmett Till in Mississippi in 1955, the murder of Medgar, civil rights activist Medgar Evers in 1963, and the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968, next week will be exactly 50 years since that date, all serve as markers on the civil rights movement timeline, as did so many other killings of black men by white races. Each tragic killing sparked nationwide protests and renewed activism in the struggle for civil rights and racial justice in the United States. The killing of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin in 2012 was a pivotal marker of racial violence against black men in the 21st century. As you all may recall, Martin was killed by George Zimmerman, who at first was not even charged with a crime. After nationwide protests, he was finally charged, but a jury ultimately acquitted him. The killing of Trayvon Martin, the initial failure of the prosecutor to charge Zimmerman with a crime, and Zimmerman's ultimate acquittal captured the attention of the nation. President Obama even weighed in, stating, quote, Trayvon Martin could have been me 35 years ago, unquote. Martin's killing also inspired the phrase, Black Lives Matter. The phrase trended on Twitter and all forms of social media and was displayed on posters carried in protests after Martin's killing and after every killing of a black man or woman by a police officer from that day forward. Black, Live, black Lives Matter ultimately became an important social justice movement. Many unarmed black men and boys have been killed since Trayvon Martin's tragic death six years ago. Many of the killings occurred after police officers arguably engaged in racial profiling, which uh, Renee will talk about shortly, stopping and harassing these men for no explainable reason other than the color of their skin. In all of the cases where black men were shot and killed, the officers claimed that they felt threatened, even though the men were unarmed and often running away or retreating. In almost all of the cases, the police officers were never arrested or charged with a crime. The tragic killings of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, and others served as the catalyst for this anthology. But these killings also inspired us to think about all of the ways that black men are policed in the broad sense of the word, heavily and harshly at every step of the criminal process. In fact, black men are policed and treated worse than their similarly situated white counterparts at every step of the criminal process from arrest through sentencing. These unwarranted disparities exist whether black men are charged with crimes or are victims of crime. Black, off, I'm sorry, police officers stop, search, and arrest black men far more frequently than white men engaged in the same behavior. Prosecutors charge black men more frequently and with more serious crimes than white men who engage in the same behavior. And there are disproportionate numbers, black, numbers of black men in the nation's prisons and jails. Criminal defendants, regardless of their race, are punished less harshly when their victims are black men. Thus, this anthology explores the policing of black men from slavery to the present day and at every stage of the criminal process and beyond. Now, many may ask why the focus on black men? Aren't there others who are treated worse in the criminal justice system than their similarly situated white counterparts? And to that I say yes, this is true. Black women, Latinos, Latinas, Native Americans, and other people of color also experience violence at the hands of the state and discriminatory treatment in the criminal justice system, as do people who are gay, lesbian, and or transgender. The book's focus on black men in no way trivializes the experiences of all people who face these harms. While acknowledging that other groups have been and continue to be oppressed and discriminated against, this book focuses on black men. Because in many ways, the experience of black men in the criminal justice system is unique. And the most noticeable difference is that they are impacted more adversely than any other demographic in the United States at every stage of the process. Black boys, for example, are disproportionately arrested and detained. Black boys are referred to the juvenile justice system more than white boys or girls. They are charged as adults more than similarly situated white boys or girls. 
Black men are disproportionately arrested. In fact, African Americans are 2.5 times more likely to be arrested than whites. And 49%, excuse me, almost half of black men can expect to be arrested at least once by age 23. Black men are more likely to be killed or injured during a police encounter. In fact, black men are 21 times more likely to be killed by police officers than white men. Black men are disproportionately imprisoned and receive longer sentences than similarly situated white men. And black men disproportionately receive the death penalty. So for all of those reasons, the book focuses on black men. Now I wanna say just a few words about my own contribution to the book, and I'll take just, I wasn't timing myself, so I don't know how long I've been talking. I'll take five minutes to, to say a bit about my own chapter before I, I call on my co-authors. Um, my chapter is called The Prosecution of Black Men, and my scholarship for the 20 years that I've been, or over 20 years that I've been a law professor, I focused on prosecutors. And people are surprised by that because I used to be a public defender. I was a public defender in the District of Columbia for a dozen years. And I think that's why I focus on prosecutors, because as a public defender, I was always fascinated by the power and discretion that prosecutors had. Um, because in essence, prosecutors control the criminal justice system, and I would argue to you that they are the most powerful officials in our criminal justice system. They control the system through their charging and plea bargaining decisions. Yes, we must focus on police officers for all the reasons I just mentioned and for all the reasons we all know. They have a lot of power and discretion on the streets to stop, search, arrest, harass, of course. But Police officers can only bring an individual to the courthouse door. It is the prosecutor who decides whether an individual remains in the system and what happens to them. They decide whether a person should be charged with a crime, what the charge should be. They decide whether they should be a plea bargain, what the plea bargain should be. They make those decisions behind closed doors and they have total discretion in making those decisions. And they are accountable to no one but the chief prosecutor in that office. Yes, theoretically, they are, they are accountable to their constituents, and most prosecutors are elected officials, which is why we all need to pay more attention to uh, prosecutorial elections. I will say this, Baltimore does pay attention to DA races in ways that many other jurisdictions do not. But in most jurisdictions, people pay no attention to that race, but it is so important because those prosecutors control the system, and it is through the electoral system that we hold them accountable because the vast majority of prosecutors are uh, elected officials and they're on the state and local level. Almost all, all except five states on the state and local level have elected prosecutors. There are thousands of them in counties across the country. Um, the federal, there are federal prosecutors, but only 10% of all criminal cases are handled in federal court. 90% of all criminal cases are prosecuted on state and local level. So we must pay attention to prosecutors. They make decisions, and the decisions that they make have a tremendous impact on the problems that we have in a criminal justice system, namely the mass incarceration problem that we have, right? We have 2.2 million people incarcerated in federal, state, or local prisons and jails. Um, all of the racial disparities I just gave you the statistics on those and many of the decisions that prosecutors make cause or exacerbate those disparities not intentionally necessarily I don't think even most of the time but I think because of implicit bias or because of the racial impact of many of the non-racial factors that prosecutors take into account they exacerbate those racial disparities oftentimes. And so this is something that prosecutors, I believe, should, should own, should understand, and should take affirmative acts to correct. You know, there's a Bible verse that says, to, much, to whom much is given, much is required. And that's what I say about prosecutors, right? They've been given all this power, so I believe that they have the responsibility to fix it. And I'm happy to say that there has been some progress and some recognition by some prosecutors. And I'd say that there is, I wouldn't call it quite a movement because a movement requires large numbers, but I think there's a beginning of a movement of more progressive people becoming prosecutors and understanding that their responsibility is, as the Supreme Court says, not to seek convictions but to do justice and who are trying to do the right thing to turn around these terrible problems that I just mentioned. So I'll stop right there and perhaps that's something we can explore 
later on during the Q&A. But I now want to turn to um, Professor Henning. Uh, her chapter in the book is called Boys to Men. You know, that's a great title. I just have to stop right there because it's just a, it's a really good title. Boys to Men, and then the sub, subtitle is The Role of Policing in the Socialization of Black Boys. And this chapter really helps the reader to understand the interplay between black boys and the police and how black boys are socialized to interact with the police and how police interact with black boys. So I'd like her now to come and talk to us about, about her chapter. Thank you all so much for coming out um, to hear us, <laughs> to hear us talk about this important issue. Um, thank you to Professor Hutchins for having us, pulling us all together, and especially um, to Professor Davis for pulling us all together to, to, to write about, to think about, um, and draw attention to this issue. So I am going to talk um, about uh, the chapter, Boys to Men. Um, and I make two broad claims in this chapter. Um, the first of which is that black boys are policed like no one else in society, right? So let's think for a moment about all of uh, the ways in which youth in general come into contact with police, right? They are uh, children who play in the streets, they laugh loudly, they drive with the music <laughs> um, playing loudly with the windows rolled down. So they're subject to uh, considerable surveillance by the police. But beyond the hyper surveillance of, of children in general, the reality is that our society is uniquely afraid of black boys, right? So let's think for a moment about Tamir Rice, right? 12-year-old boy who is killed in Cleveland um, by the police. And how many of you remember what the police and the prosecutors kept saying over and over again when they were asked about um, why, why the shooting happened? Does anybody remember? He looked, he looked older, right? So they repeatedly talked about uh, his size. Um, they remarked that he weighed uh, 175, 170 pounds, he stood five feet, seven inches tall. He was wearing a size 36 pants and an extra large jacket. And they kept focusing on that. Um, and apparently, I mean, all of you have seen that baby face, right? So apparently they just missed the baby face because they were so focused on uh, everything else. Um, and the research shows, though, that this phenomena, this perception of Tamir is not unusual. Right? So there's a, a very recent study that a number of you may have seen that actually has gotten a number of sort of popular attention in, in the press. Um, it was a 2014 study by Philip Atiba Goff, um, who, along with some colleagues, studied the perception of innocence of black children, um, uh, particularly black children purportedly involved with the law. Um, and so what did they do? They asked a group of participants, both law enforcement uh, uh, folks and the general public to look at a series of photographs. It was actually a series of four studies. So this is a very layman's version of what the study was. But they had um, the participants look at a series of photographs. And the first thing they did was to uh, group or to estimate the age of all of the children, black, white, and Latino based on certain age categories. Um, another aspect of the study um, required them to assess generally or to rate the innocence. There's an innocence scale, but the perceived innocence of children generally, of black children, and of, Latino, and of white children. And then in another really important aspect of the study, again, they showed photographs of these children, again, black, white, and Latina, involved in alleged felony behavior or alleged misdemeanor behavior. And the participants had to both assess age and to assess perceived culpability based on the photographs alone. All right? We, are, we should not at all be surprised at what the outcomes were. Um, among the general public, the participants perceived um, African American youth felony suspects to be 4.53 years older than they actually were. Among law enforcement, um, I'm sorry, the, the first one was uh, among the general public. Among the law enforcement, uh, those participants also rated African American youth felony suspects to be 4.5 year, 4.59 years older than they actually were. Among both the general public and among law enforcement, all of them perceived white youth to be less culpable when suspected of a felony 
than when suspected of a misdemeanor. I had to pause and think about, well, what does that mean? It's almost as if to say there's no way <laughs> this white kid <laughs> could be involved in a criminal activity of this severity, right? So it was discounting um, the likelihood. And black felony suspects, youth felony suspects were perceived as significantly more culpable than either white felony suspects or uh, Latino felony suspects. So and let me just sort of close that study and really drive home the point the findings show that the innocence of black children between the ages of 10 and 13 was perceived to be equivalent to that of other children between the ages of 14 and 17, right? Where am I going next, okay? The innocence, the perceived innocence of black children ages 14 to 17, right, was perceived to be equivalent to that of adults, non-black adults, right? So we've now adultified them. Um, they were perceived to be um, between the ages of 18 and 21. This is tremendous, has a tremendous impact on the way we as a society uh, respond uh, uh, to children who are engaged in at-risk or impulsive behavior. Um, and uh, Professor Davis started to talk about that, right? What does this mean for young black boys? It means that they're more likely to be treated as adults, tried in adult courts. They're more likely than white boys to receive the benefits or the special mitigation right, in juvenile courts. They, they're less likely to receive the special benefits of adolescence. They're more likely to be stopped, arrested, and assaulted, and in Tamir's case, and in many other young black boys' cases, they're more likely to be shot um, or physically injured. So what else does it mean? It also means that our current policing strategy in black and brown communities is counterproductive to the ultimate aim of public safety. So what, what do I mean by that? <laughs> um, that's my second broad claim. It's this claim about, or this, this, this conversation about the ways in which um, black boys are socialized. Um, and the research shows that the um, early encounters, a child's early encounters with the police and other law enforcement entities has a profound effect on the ways in which they perceive, um, obey, and respect the law and law enforcement. Um, and so let's just think about what it means to grow up as a young black boy in our society and all the ways in which they're socialized to engage with or avoid, as it were, or try to avoid police officers um, at home, right? We all know that, uh, well, many of us know that black parents frequently teach their children to do what? <laughs> right? Put your hands up, avoid sudden gestures, um, don't do nothing, don't say anything smart, don't play with BB guns, all right? But kids will still be kids, right? like Tamir, kids will still be kids. Um, and so these are lessons that parents teach their children not only to keep them safe, but it also instills fear, rightfully so, fear um, and negative images and attitudes about the police and young black boys. And then these uh, um, children go on to school and what happens in school, right? The negative images, the negative interactions are reinforced, particularly in neighborhoods or in urban school systems that have a high school resource officer uh, presence. And it's ironic, I always say this, it's ironic that metal detectors, uh, security cameras, um, school resource officers are most common where? In urban communities, right? With black and brown children, when where do most of the high profile shootings? Yeah. Yes, the mass school shootings. Yeah have been in, right, have been in um, predominantly white and often middle class neighborhoods, but not always. Um, it's also even more ironic, when I started doing some research about where did this SRO movement come from, proponents or advocates of SROs in schools argue that SROs are necessary to improve youth police relationships. <laughs> Right? Um, to improve the image that uh, children have of police officers and the public has of police officers in general and to improve the respect. It's literally written into the, you know, to the, to the early um, uh, writings about SROs, but to improve the respect um, that young people have for law enforcement. We all know that is far from what has happened, right? Law, uh, school resource officers have only enhanced the school to prison pipeline. They've increased the racial disparity They've enhanced the, uh, the tensions between uh, children of color and police officers. Um, and the reality is that police, uh, that police officers will be police officers 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week, 365 days of the year. They arrest, 
kids in school, they investigate crimes in school, they report kids to probation officers, and so this idea of the school-friendly police officer has never really materialized, especially in urban school systems. Um, and then children leave school in the afternoon, and what do they do? They have negative, black boys have negative on the street encounters with the police. Um, and there's a great deal of qualitative, or a fair amount, and there needs to be more, but there's a fair amount of qualitative research on the perception that black boys have of police officers. Um, and in interview after interview, the young black boys complain of the sheer number of police officers in their neighborhoods, right? They complain about repeated uh, police officers who stop them repeatedly over and over again, even when they don't find contraband the first time. They complain about police officers stopping them like five and six times a day to say to them, where are you going, where are you coming from, um, uh, in ways that are just uh, completely uncalled for. Black boys particularly resent um, being told to assume the position to sit or lie on the ground, put their hands on the wall, um, put their hands on the car, pull down their pants, let me do a cavity search, even when the criminal um, act or the alleged offense um, doesn't even involve <laughs> something that might require a cavity search. And I gotta say, um, as Professor Davis said, I am uh, a professor at Georgetown. I teach the, the juvenile defender clinic, so I represent kids all the time. These stories that I write about in the chapter all came from my cases, right? So in addition to this qualitative research, there's tons of anecdotal research. It happens um, in DC, it happens in Baltimore and other urban um, and, and rural centers. Um, and if the young black boys don't have these encounters themselves, we've got social media now, um, internet, all you have to do is pull up uh, videos and you can see um, what the kids are seeing. And they're seeing um, police officers who are engaging with youth in very aggressive tones, um, using profanity, racial slurs, um, terms like punk or sissy um, and the like. And so what do young black boys do um, about that? How do they respond, right? They respond with fear, they respond with flight, and they respond with what I call fight. In other words, resistance, right? So um, what do black boys do when they see the police? Run, right? They run. Um, they decline to seek police assistance even when they've been injured themselves or the, the, the victim of a crime themselves. Um, they often, they certainly, more than often, refuse to snitch, right? <laughs> Snitching gets snitches. <laughs> um, um, they would rather settle disputes on their own than to be involved with the police altogether. So again, this is counterproductive, right? This type of aggressive hyper-policing of black boys is actually counterproductive to public safety. Right, um, and when black boys can avoid the police, they do what kids do, right? They talk back, they curse, they complain about the, the unfair uh, treatment and injustice, um, and unfortunately, we all know that this type of resistance and this type of avoidance never achieves the goal that they want of correcting uh, law enforcement injustice, right? It doesn't um, uh, achieve the goals that we want. Young black boys don't have the luxury of complaining. They don't have the luxury of talking back, right? Um, and they don't even have the luxury of running away because we see what happens um, when, when young black boys uh, run away. So um, as I sit in the law school um, at, with you, and I you know, see many students here, I just I always think um, about what can you do, right? Um, and I think about, I hope many of you will become public defenders. I hope many of you will become prosecutors. Though I favor the defense side. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, but, but it, you know, and seriously, I, you know, I've been thinking a lot as a public defender and working with my students about how to retool um, what we're doing as public defenders and how we raise race um, in every aspect of our advocacy from the time, from the source of the referral all the way through conditions of confinement, right? How do we be explicit about it? And we're developing toolkits and resources for rethinking how we litigate the Fourth Amendment, which is very difficult to raise race in the Fourth Amendment context, and the reasonable person standard and the race neutral, reasonable, articulable suspicion stand, uh, 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 factors. And I love how all the students are nodding. <laughs> this is good, you know your Fourth Amendment law. I could do some Socratic method, but yeah. Um, 
But, but we really, uh, you know, um, we're, we're doing, we're sort of teeing up and working with groups of defenders across the country and pockets across the country to think about how do we, how do we change that? How do we uh, infuse, um, if we don't want to go so far and call it the controversial reasonable black child standard, what else? Right? Like, how can we still make the point? Okay? So, I'd love to have some of you guys join the public defender movement, thinking about how to do training uh, with police officers. We've got a, um, at Georgetown, we've launched for the first time this year a Police for Tomorrow. Uh, project where literally five faculty, um, including Paul Butler, who I, whose book I recommend to you in addition to Policing the Black Man, called Chokehold, but there's a number of us. Um, Christy Lopez, who did the Ferguson, she wrote the Ferguson out of DOJ, we're really getting together and working with MPD, DC uh, Metropolitan Police Department, um, uh, for a year-long fellowship. Uh, we have 19 folks in the fellowship program and thinking about how to uh, uh, reform policing, how to improve policing, and to, to pay attention to questions of race and homelessness and mental illness and adolescence, all of those things. And next year, we're going to bring students into the mix and figure out how to do that. So I just encourage you all to be innovative. Grab professors like Hutchins and, um, <laughs> uh, and the like who are doing this work. You've got some great folks here. Um, doing the work. So um, there's also systemic reform you can get involved in, uh, changing uh, the, the, the structure of SROs in schools. How can you as a student advocate um, for the removal of SROs from schools? Legislative advocacy. How can we decriminalize normal adolescent behavior, um, particularly in communities of color? So I'll stop there because hopefully we'll have you know, some Q&A time um, and you all can be thinking about what you want to do. Thank you, Professor Henning. And I now want to ask Professor Hutchins to come and talk about her essay. It's called Racial Profiling, the Law, the Policy, and the Practice. As you know, many of these instances of killings started with racial profiling. So Professor Hutchins, please come and talk to us about racial profiling. I will. I will. Good evening. Um, I am going to do what I always forget to do whenever, um, whenever we do these book talks, and I am going to say thank you. Um, because I, I always forget. <laughs> um, and these two women, if y'all don't know, you should know, are absolute hellfire. And I am so honored. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I am honored to be a part of the collection of authors that you pulled together and you know, who is writing uh, with us for this book. Um, so I am going to be talking about uh, my chapter, which, as Angela said, is about racial profiling. And for decades, black men have been complaining that they were policed differently, um, that, they were, that they were treated more harshly, they were treated more aggressively, they were treated with greater suspicion um, by police officers. And that lived reality was shared anecdotally for the most part. Um, it went from parent to child. It went from um, faith leader to congregation. Um, it went from teacher to student. Um, and it went from neighbor to neighbor. Um, and the point of that, those stories, the point of that shared reality, that lived reality, was about navigation. It was about helping young black children navigate safely from childhood to adulthood in a white world that could be violently and aggressively dangerous to young black children. And so the, the um, open casket of, of Emmett Till reminded the world of what so many black parents knew. Life in the streets could be dangerous for black kids when they were confronted with by white law enforcement. And so the truth of that lived reality prompted a lot of different things. The truth of that reality prompted the talk, which my, both my co-authors mentioned, right? It's the conversation that, that far too many black parents, including myself, have with their children about how to navigate a police encounter safely. It prompted, in part, some of the Great Migration, right? A huge bit of the Great Migration was about seeking better economic realities. But, but some of the Great Migration was about escaping an oppressive racial culture in the South that was violently dangerous for young black men. Um, 
And it also inspired, sort of in pop culture, it inspired lyrics. You know, everyone from Gil Scott Herring to NWA talked about oppressive policing and racialized policing. Um, and it also inspired some of the worst race riots that this country has ever seen. So from the Northeast to the Midwest, stories of real and imagined, stories of, of police encounters, white police encounters with young black men triggered some of the most violent reaction to racial oppression that this country has ever seen. Um, we experienced it here in Baltimore just a few years ago um, when Freddie Gray died in police custody. And that was not even a particularly violent, right? I don't know that I would even call those riots. It was more unrest. Um, but because the stories were anecdotal, they could be dismissed. Because the stories were anecdotal, people didn't necessarily have to buy in. And so for, for, for many, 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 um, they were just discounted as untrue. And for those who accepted them, um, they were frequently justified. And so what happened was the narrative of this lived reality of racial oppression was met with a counter narrative about black criminality. And the counter narrative suggested, well, of course they're being policed differently. They commit more crime, right? That was the counter narrative that met the lived reality narrative. But in the 90s, data collection got quite a bit better. And what that data collection told us was the narrative was true, and for the most part, the counter narrative was a lie. And that data collection took a couple of different forms. So sometimes it came in the form of statistics. And so in places like New York, where we saw a class action lawsuit filed for the stop and frisk practice of the police, we saw statistics like the fact that in 2012, 700 1,000 New Yorkers were stopped on the streets of New York, 700,000 in 2012 alone. Of that number, we now know that 85% were black or Latino men. The statistics also told us that over an eight-year period, from 2004 to 2012, 4.4 million New Yorkers were stopped. And over that eight-year period, and over those millions of stops, the statistics held. 85 to 90% of those stops were of young, black, or brown men. 90% of the people stopped, this is with regard to the counter-narrative, right? 90% of the people stopped were released. No evidence of criminality at all was found with regard to 90% of the people that were stopped in New York. The other stuff that we started to learn in terms of statistics about the counter-narrative was that the story about enhanced black criminality was, for the most part, across most categories of criminal conduct, simply not true. So take, for example, drug use. About 9% of whites and about 10% of blacks use illegal drugs, approximately. And what we know from talking to the users is that most people buy drugs from people of their own race. Most drug sales are not cross-racial drug sales. So you would expect, if 9% of whites and about 10% of blacks use illegal drugs, you would expect, and we know that people buy drugs from people of their own race, we would expect the numbers to be roughly similar in terms of criminal prosecutions, except they're not. So in states like Maryland, here in Maryland, Blacks are about 30% of the population. Um, we are about 70% of the prison population. And that is in a state where drug offenses are the number one driver of incarceration. Right? In addition to statistics, it was also trial testimony. So we also got trial testimony as prosecutors got moderately better, and I'm moderately <laughs> better about protecting the civil rights of black and brown men, we started to get trial testimony out from police officers who testified about the unconstitutional conduct of their colleagues. And we also saw videos. Um, and I would suggest that the videos, as you know, Angela's comments reflected, the videos are not particularly helping with the conviction. Um, of police officers who kill unarmed black men, but I think they are raising the social awareness with regard to that issue. And so we can all remember, right, watching the video of Walter Scott being shot in the back as he ran from the police officer who stopped him. 
We can all remember Philando Castile, who was a cafeteria worker at a school, being shot as he sat in his car, as he attempted to comply with what the police officer was asking him for, identification. Right? We can all remember Tamir Rice, who I swear to this day I cannot look at without seeing my oldest son. Right? We can all remember that child, 12-year-old child, being shot within seconds of the police showing up at that playground even though the caller who reported that he had seen a child in the park thought that what the child was playing with was a toy gun. That was the information that the police had. That child was still killed within seconds of the police engaging with him. Last week, Stefan Clark was shot 20 times in his grandmother's backyard. He had a cell phone in his hand. And three days ago, three days ago, Danny Ray Thomas was shot as he wandered aimlessly down the street with his pants around his ankles, clearly suffering from some sort of a mental disability or mental break. He was shot six times. He was also unarmed. And so the question that I explore in my chapter is how, how can this lived reality coexist in a country that professes to believe in equal protection under the law. How is it possible for those two things to exist at the same time? And so one of the answers is implicit bias, right? And I explore that a little in my chapter, but one of our co-authors, Catherine Russell Brown, does a much more extensive and much better job of exploring the role of implicit bias in racialized policing. Um, but another answer is that the Supreme Court has said it's okay, right? And so the Fourth Amendment says that people cannot be subject to unreasonable searches and seizures. But the Supreme Court has said that it is not unreasonable to consider race as a factor in policing. Right? And so that's a part of how we get to this disconnect <laughs> between the national ideal and the lived reality of so many black and brown Americans. And it started a very long time ago. It started in Korematsu. Korematsu was one of the earliest forays of the court into an acceptance of racialized policing. And Korematsu was not a Fourth Amendment case, right? Korematsu was challenging his conviction after he refused to leave his home and report to an internment camp. It wasn't a Fourth Amendment case. But in that case, the court absolutely accepted the impact of race in the criminal justice system. And three of the dissenters who wrote in that case actually warned us of what was to come. So three of the dissenters who wrote in that case said, once a judicial opinion rationalizes such an order to show that it conforms to the Constitution, or rather, rationalizes the Constitution to show that the Constitution sanctions such an order, the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure. That principle then, lies, principle then lies about like a loaded weapon ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. And that is exactly what we saw about 23 years after Korematsu and Terry. Even though race was never really explicitly articulated as a rationale for Terry, all of the urgent need language and the national security language and the need for enhanced policing language that found its seeds in Korematsu, we see in Terry, right? And in Terry, the court expands the authority of the police to engage in non-consensual encounters with civilians. And then post-Terry, about 10, 15 years post-Terry, we see the court more explicitly under the Fourth Amendment embrace the use of race. And so in a pair of immigration cases, Brignani Ponce and Martinez Fuerte, the court says that absolutely it is okay to use race, not as a factor, but in the second case, as the factor in making a decision about whether to stop. And then it came full circle in 1995 in Wren. And so in Wren, under the Fourth Amendment, the court finally says, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay for the police to use race as a factor in policing, even though in that case it was pretty clear that at least one of the two officers had decided to pull over Wren's car because Wren and his buddy were young black men in a really nice car in a high drug crime area, neighborhood. 
And so post Wren, there were some of us that were hopeful that, well, maybe, maybe Wren just applies to probable cause and arrest and those sorts of stuff. But post Wren, the court kicked the door wide open again and said, now, kid, yeah, Wren actually applies to all justified police stops. So reasonable suspicion, too, right? And so that's how we get to a world that accepts both a lived reality of differential policing and a professed goal of equal protection under the law. The court has built a solid wall of disregard for race under the Constitution, in my view. Right? And so what the court has said essentially is that race can be a factor, it can't be the factor, and the problem with that is that only the most unimaginative police officer cannot come up with a reason other than race for why they stop someone. Right? And this hits home. So my husband was stopped a couple of weeks ago. We have been the only black family in our neighborhood for about 15 years. Montgomery County, 2018. He was walking. That's what he does. That's how he exercises. He walks. <laughs> so he was walking. So he's walking down the block this way. White couple's walking down the block this way. They're exercising, he's exercising. They get just past him on the other end of the block. All of a sudden, he can see behind him and hear behind him flashing lights and sirens. Police officer, blah, blah, blah. police officer jumps out of the car. Sir, where are you going? My husband is 50 years old. <laughs> he's a lot of things, but he is not scary. <laughs> Sir, where are you going? Why are you stopping me? Well, you look suspicious. Literally, that's the first thing the police officer told him when he stopped him. He looked suspicious. My husband said, because he'd been married to me for entirely too long. <laughs> well, what about me looks suspicious? <laughs> and the officer said, well, and here's what I mean when I say that only the most unimaginative police officer <laughs> could not come up with a reason other than race for having stopped somebody. He said, well, it's the way that you're dressed. My husband said, what about the way that I'm dressed? I got on a Carhartt jacket. I got on a Gap sweatshirt. <laughs> what about the way that I am dressed? I can't write. <laughs> what about the way that I am dressed makes me suspicious? Well, sir, you're getting a little. My husband is an adult. So my husband can dial it back. My husband can play the game. But you know what? I got two little boys at home, 14 and 16 years old. And for all the reasons that Chris talked about, if that police officer had pulled over one of my kids for looking suspicious instead of my husband, I can't actually tell you which way that interaction would have gone. And so then we get to the question of why should we care, <laughs> right? Supreme Court has said it's OK. Well, I can tell you why I care. I care because I don't want my husband to get shot because he goes out for a walk. I care because I don't want my two children not coming home because they looked suspicious to a police officer in Montgomery County. I don't want my kid to be Tamir Rice. I don't want my kid to be Alton Sterling or Philando Castile or Michael Brown. And the list goes on and on. That's why I care. But I would suggest that everybody should care, that not just the people in the affected community should care, but everybody should care. Paul Butler said, and I, in a, not in his book Chokehold, which is fabulous and I recommend it to all of you, but, but said in an essay that he wrote comparing stop and frisk policing to terror light, he said racial profiling is about social control. It is about racial humiliation. It is about teaching people their place. And so I would suggest to you that the harm, that harm of that racial humiliation is not born exclusively by the person who experiences it. It passes in the ether to the entire community in a way that is corrosive to democratic fundamentals. And so it creates racial disparities downstream in the criminal justice system, it creates, as, as, as Randall Kennedy wrote quite poignantly, 
It gives rise to witnesses who fail to cooperate with the police, citizens who view prosecutors as the enemy, lawyers who disdain the rules they have sworn to uphold, and jurors who yearn to get even with a system that has, in their eyes, consistently mistreated them. Right? There is a um, poem, and I will end on this, because I think I'm running out of time. Um, there's a poem that I think uh, many of you are probably very familiar with. Um, and it says, when they came for the um, when the Nazis came for the communist, I remained silent because I was not a communist. And when they locked up the social democrats, I remained silent because I was not a social democrat. When they came for the trade unionist, I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And when they came for the Jews, I remained silent because I wasn't a Jew. When they came for me, there was no one left to speak. I would suggest to you that they are coming for the Fourth Amendment. And right now, the face of that attack is black and brown, but it will not always be. It will not always be. And so I would suggest to you that it is long past time for us to speak out, that that is why people who are not in affected communities should care. Thank you. Thank you all so much, and I know we're going to take uh, questions. I just want to put the legal caveat out here. Uh, this is recorded so that students who aren't here can, can hear it. So uh, our panelists know that. But if you're asking a question, uh, I want you to know that the, the question is being recorded as well. So. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. And I, I hope you all now know why I asked these brilliant women to join me in this project. I really thank you both so much for those wonderful uh, comments. So now it's your turn. Um, I invite you, if you have questions, to step up to the mic, ask your question. And I think we have maybe 15 minutes or so for questions. Q&A? Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Oh, wait. He's coming to fix it. So I was conveniently located, so I <laughs> took this first question. Um, I'm actually an alumni, shout out to alumni 2015. Um, uh, and I work in education policy, so I, I'm on a commission to eradicate the school to prison pipeline and restorative practices here in Maryland. Um, I'm also the chair of a coalition to reform school discipline. And so I work a lot with uh, racialized discipline, disparities and practices. Um, right now we're doing you know, local school police regulation and trying to help the, um, you know, help to carve constitutional protections for Baltimore City's um, youth. Um, and right now, one of the challenges that we have is we're trying to develop like a youth Miranda standard um, because we argue that youth are not at the appropriate age or um, mental capacity to knowingly and voluntarily and intelligently um, consent or give up their um, Fifth or Sixth Amendment, and it we're reached with a lot of challenges. Um, you know, the police and the city schools obviously don't want to accept that standard. So I'm just really here. Thank you, first of all. I, I, this is great, yeah. but I want to get some advice on next steps. Um, you know, just some encouragement on how we can continue this fight. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna so, yeah, defer to you. you. <laughs> So let me just say just a couple of things, you know, immediately pop, to, uh, pop in my head. I wonder to what extent you have partnered with the Maryland uh, Public Defender Office. Um, yes. And if, okay, great. Because yep. there are a couple of people I can mm -hmm. think of by name who would love and eat this project up. Okay. Um, I mean, Youth Miranda standard, forget Youth Miranda, <laughs> like forget police interrogation in schools, yeah. right, all together. Um, yeah, and you've got, just, right. yeah, we don't want it to happen at all. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. Um, but as a second step or as a next best option, having volunteer public defenders you know, on call, right, uh -huh. to be present for legal advice to these kids before they um, engage in any interrogation. I also would say to, the, to ask you to what extent you've looked at, you know, a 50 state search in terms of very few, there's very few um, other states that have prohibited um, uh, 
interrogation of children without either their parents without a lawyer. I don't think without parents is enough. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. parents and unfortunately don't understand Miranda mm -hmm. <laughs> much more than their kids do, and they urge their kids to go ahead, fess up, all yeah. of that. So I'm not so much in favor of that, but having um, uh, laws on the book, so legislative advocacy around the issue. Um, I mean, you've got some good case law one of the things the Supreme Court is starting to do right is understanding kids and adolescents better. Sure, JDB yeah. versus North Carolina, I'm sure you're yeah. familiar with. Yeah. So it sounds like you're thinking in the right direction. She's, she's giving me all the knives. This is good. <laughs> this is good. I think it's great. I, you know, love to chat with you more about okay. it. I think it's awesome. Okay. Awesome. Great, great project. And don't leave the federal public defender out of it. So I see some, some reps from the federal public defender back there. Um, make sure you're plugging them into the conversations too along with OPD. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you for presenting. I'm gonna, this is like a two part question, but I'm gonna make it quick. Um, so I think it's interesting that the Supreme Court applies race, race neutral standards when it's played an integral role in what we now know as race. Um, I'm thinking about Supreme Court decisions like Bhagat Singh Thind. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering how one, how do we kind of, I guess, unwork or decolonize both the legal institution because of the role that it's played in developing race and racism, as well as the police institu policing institution and practices? My second question is, how do you all maintain critical hope that things will get better? Um, because I, you know, Jeff Duncan Andrade talks a lot about maintaining critical hope in doing work around racial equity, and that's what I do when I'm not doing lawyering things. Um, but I'm wondering how do you maintain critical hope when you are part of a legal institution that has led to the development of race? I'm gonna sit back down now, but I'm still listening. Um, so, so either one of you wanna take the first question or, or either I one? I can do it in either direction. Either so, so really brief thought with regard to the first. I would say that we've gotta start earlier in terms of encouraging kids to um, enter these professions. I, mm -hmm. I uh, yes. taught a high school class the other day. Here at the law school we do, um, we do mock law days for some of the local high schools and was teaching a class and a student came up to me after the class and said, um, is, is this the way law school is? And I said, uh, roughly, right? Like, we did a summary version. You know, I just, we, <laughs> roughly. <laughs> um, and he said, uh, he said, oh, well, that's, that's good. I, I think that I might be able to do this. And I said, well, what do you mean? Why would you think that you couldn't do this? And he said, well, because my counselor told me that law school was hard, and, and so I shouldn't go, right? And so we've got to defeat messages like that. There are pervasive messages in this society about what smart looks like um, and what professionals look like, and we have got to, at every turn, confront those messages and make sure that we are we are projecting out broader messages. Um, and uh, with regard to maintaining hope, I would just say, I've got kids. I can't afford not to have hope. Mm -hmm. I can't, right? So um, if, my, if my parents had, had given up hope, I wouldn't be where I am. And if their grandparents had given up hope, they wouldn't be where they were. Um, we can't afford to give up hope. That's not an option. It's just yeah. not an option. Yeah. I guess I would say um, two things that maybe intersect in terms of the hope and how do you sort of <laughs> uh, undo years of entrenched legal theory. Um, one is, uh, the hope is in um, Massachusetts versus Warren, or Warren versus the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I see some people nodding, woo-hoo. Uh, so the, so the, um, uh, the highest court of the state of Massachusetts said, right, that a black man who flees or fleeing um, by itself is not enough because there's so many reasons to flee. Um, and then I realized today as I was leaving, getting in my car to come here, one of my uh, staff attorneys at Georgetown came running after me, oh my god, the DCCA just released a new case. And she's like jumping up and down because it had cited um, uh, uh, Warren versus Commonwealth and then gone on to in include all of the implicit racial bias studies and all of the stats and the data. And we were literally having a party. I was like, okay, I'm now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, so, so there's hope in that if the state courts, at the highest, you know, state courts, that people are, are are sitting up and paying attention, and that we do it one state at a time, and maybe the mm -hmm. Supreme Court will, will start paying attention. So I think there's that. Um, I I think um, 
Also in terms of hope, I mean, Renee talked about videos, right? And how mm -hmm. the outrage, so it may not be changing, um, <laughs> You know, conviction rates, conviction rates yeah. but it's absolutely changing outrage and I think more and more people are paying attention I mean you you know Dean Tobin you said you like reading people are now asking for books like this reading yeah. books like this understanding the issues in ways that they had not understood even people who are liberal and engaged and 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 care about democracy are beginning to get it um, I think with 45 in office right uh -huh. <laughs> we're more outraged right it takes a little bit of outrage to get people excited and energized and with every horrific shooting, mm -hmm. you know, you get something, right? The Black Lives Matter, you get mm -hmm. the movement. And so I'm energized um, by the young people. The final thing I'll say, and I will shut up, is do one thing, <laughs> um, is the do one thing approach, which is yep. this, if you think about the criminal justice system and all of the problems, that are, you know, um, in the criminal justice system, you will be exceedingly overwhelmed. Yeah. But can you pick one thing? Yes. Right? Can you pick one aspect, right? Um, whether it's um, individual advocacy, whether it's training um, uh, 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 police officers, whether it's training prosecutors, I am mesmerized. So I'm with, I'm with um, uh, Professor Davis here in this idea that there is this growing ban <laughs> of progressive prosecutors, although the number is small. Um, the number of invitations now that I get to come and talk to people in prosecutors' offices, whole, you know, full-fledged, you know, prosecutorial training from the defense bar, woo, that's a little scary. Um, but they're interested in the conversation, they wanna do better, people care, um, even if they don't know how. And, and I, just to say, you know, on the hope piece, and I tell people, it's hard not to get totally discouraged and give up hope when you see this okay. You know, so, you know this started, you know, 400 years ago, and it's still going on, so how do you not give up? And so what I do when I find myself thinking, you know, how can I go on, is I go visit the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And that, if you haven't visited it, it will give you some perspective, because when I see what my people went through and what they survived, I know, give up this, I mean, it, it, it reinvigorates me. You know, it makes me sad, but it reinvigorates me. And I also can't give up hope because I have Grandchildren, I'm a little older than her, <laughs> a lot older. And so I can't give up hope. And I also am encouraged. I mean, you know, if, you don't, if you've never heard of, anybody heard of Larry Krasner, who's the district yes. attorney for yes. Philly? Yes. So Google know. Larry Krasner and just look at what he's doing, right? Yeah. A civil rights lawyer uh -huh. who ran for district attorney and won, a white man, by the way, with the support of the Black Lives Matter movement in mm -hmm. Philly. And he came in that office and he fired 31 prosecutors because they were not with his program, which is about ending mass incarceration and reducing racial disparities. And he's done phenomenal things. Most recently issued a memo to his staff. And if you just Google and Larry Krasner and put in memo, you'll see it, which is phenomenal. Basically directing them about how they're not to charge certain Think, you know, they're not to seek more than a certain amount of time in jail. Every time they ask for prison time, they are required on the record in open court to say how much it's going to cost and to justify on the record why they're asking to lock this person up. And giving very clear guidelines about how much time they can ask for, when they can't ask for time, you know, you know releasing people who are on money bonds. So, you know, it, it, it can happen. You know, you just have to get the right people there to make those decisions. And, you know, he's not the only one. Kim Fox is another one, if you don't know that name, in Chicago. Look up Kim Fox, African-American woman in Chicago who's doing similar things, and I could go on and on, but I see there are questions, so I'll see. You guys talked briefly about mental illness, so I wanted to understand or expand upon how mental illness affects the criminalization of black men or whatever resources or how mental illness affect the whole process of police brutality and many topics engaged or connected to that. So um, what I would just say briefly is it's something that is not unique to black people. We have chosen um, to criminalize a couple of different issues that would probably be treated better in a national health system. So we have chosen to criminalize drug abuse. We have chosen to criminalize in, in many ways mental health um, issues. Um, and so the, the same problems um, that, and the same challenges that are faced by trying to deal with mental health and drug addiction in a system that is ill-equipped to treat either one of those issues um, plays out in the black community 
um, in the same ways that it plays out in other communities, but because of differential policing, because of the ways in which the criminal justice system impacts black people more heavily and more aggressively than it impacts other populations, those issues are exacerbated in, in, in the, in, with regard to the policing of black men. It's a huge issue. Um, uh, it's you know not only the decriminalization of normal adolescent behavior, we also have to decriminalize mental health issues. Period. The number of people who um, who are shot by police. Yes. I mean, we should do the comparative yes. analysis. Who are shot by police for um, a, a aggressive um, uh, uh, outburst as a result of. Um, some mental illness mm -hmm. is just, it's deplorable, right? I, um, in the juvenile justice system, the way, I mean, especially in the juvenile justice system where you see sort of the earliest signs of mental illness, and so the children are even more impulsive mm -hmm. than normal adolescents, right? And then they are being brought into a criminal justice system and placed in congregate care in detention facilities, mm -hmm. right? And, and people don't understand why they act out in the detention facilities. Right. And then they get put in isolation. So, I mean, you're... <laughs> I'm like sort of almost not prepared to talk about it because I get so emotional about it um, and I haven't gotten my head around what the solutions are. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, how extreme the, the problems are actually just today um, uh, representing a young girl um, and we finally got her psychiatric report and in the psychiatric report we find out all this information we previously, I honestly, didn't know which was that, um, uh, that our client's mother revealed that her own mother had schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Right, and the child now at the age of 13 is being diagnosed with with um, a bipolar disorder, and this child we have ha she's been in detention, she's been in group homes, she's been in we could not you know get our judge to let her out, and now we have sort of the explanation. So you're treating this mentally ill young girl in the detention facilities, right, or in the not treating her, right, mm -hmm. or responding to her through the criminal and juvenile justice system. That child should be nowhere near. A, a juvenile court, um, nowhere near a police officer. So it's everything. I think it's community education. I'm really just spinning off the top of my head. It's police training, mm -hmm. and there are there are growing. I actually will say there are um, uh, programs um, and, and curricula for police officers in how to respond to mental illness. Um, uh, in the District of Columbia, for example, um, I'm not sure which agency, but they have developed a whole like sort of cheat sheet for police officers. When you arrive on the scene and someone appears to be mentally ill, here are the hotlines. Don't try to handle this yourself, call, mm -hmm. right? Don't arrest. So there's there's some movement across the country on this question. I know in the school system, they now have a, a what they call a mobile crisis health, health, um, health hotline um, by the Department of Mental Health in, in DC. So there's little bitty movement, but the fact that I'm representing a little girl, 13 year old girl who should never have been in the system says there are far more children and adults are. who are being sucked up yep. in law enforcement than ever should be. Mm -hmm. So I just, that's the, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> it really is a problem. <laughs> so I think we have time for one or two more questions, if there are any. If there are not, okay, one more. No more. Hi, ladies. Thank you for doing this. Um, my question is, how do you respond to the argument or sentiment that sharing these stories of these black men being killed or maimed or you know, abused by these police officers um, doesn't do anything but traumatize those who are affected mm -hmm. by it mm -hmm. and overwhelm those who aren't to the point where they kind of just sit on their hands because mm -hmm. I'm tired of explaining to white people why I should be human, right? Like, I'm tired of having to like describe my humanity for some people on Facebook. Like, if it's not a cat video, it's a black man being shot. No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, right? Like, so it's exhausting for me to constantly read about these. It's exhausting for me to constantly talk about it, to mm -hmm. explain it. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to explain yep. why Stephen Clark shouldn't have been shot 20 right. times. Mm -hmm. And so how do you respond to that argument that like we keep sharing this, we keep having these talks. I love these talks, I could do this all day. But when I go home, I cry, because I can't, like what am I supposed to do? So how, how can we move forward from having conversations and talking about you know Facebook and Twitter comments and actually doing something or getting people who aren't affected to do something about it? So I'll, I'll start with that one. You absolutely should not have to, and you should. It's not your responsibility to explain racism to anybody, and it is traumatizing 
to keep talking about it and having to explain it, in addition to living it every minute and every day. So you shouldn't feel that responsibility. But at the same time, I cannot say that we must stop talking about it, right? We can't stop talking about it. I think that individual people, like you, like me, when I just get tired, you know, like racism wears me out. And, you know, so there are some days it's like, you know what, today I just can't, you know? So there's some days, though, that I'm like, you know, I'm going to do it. And there are other days that I just, my psyche can't handle it. And I hope that the next black person will take it on. <laughs> So, I mean, and I, I'm just not even trying to be funny. It's just very real because it is debilitating. And it's also, black people, we have health problems. What do they say when, when, when white folks get a headache, we get a brain tumor? I mean, whatever. <laughs> all of the health problems out here, on a serious note, we are affected by them much more. And racism, the studies have shown, have a lot to do with the fact that we have more hypertension all the time. So we have to take care of our own health. At the same time, we certainly can't, we as a people, and I mean everybody in this world, can't stop talking about it, writing about it, agitating about it. We can't stop doing that. And we also have to call on our white allies to talk to talk about it too. And I think it's sometimes more effective, quite frankly, to have the white allies talking about this issue to white folks. And I feel like as Renee said, we all have to take responsibility for this. It can't just be those of us who are affected. And we do have white, I mean, I'm looking at this room and I'm gathering that most of the white folks here probably all of them are not here because they disagree with me, right? <laughs> so I'm heartened by the fact that, look at this room, right? How diverse this room is. It shows me that it's not just black folks that care about this issue. And so I would urge the, our white friends and allies. I mean, how many of you know Tim Wise? Anybody know Tim Wise? So look at Tim Wise's work, a white man who sort of has taken this on to explain white supremacy to white people. And there are other people like that. So I think we all have to do that. And then how to get discouraged. I'll go back to what Chris says, and I say this all the time. People are like, oh, I'm so overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. And I just say, everybody can't do everything, but everybody can do something. And so, like she said, pick a thing and work on it, you know? If the, if the juvenile issue is, is what you are doing such great work with and what Chris is doing such great work, I'm on fire about prosecutors and have been for 25 years. <laughs> so everybody's got to find the thing and work really hard on it. And you know, you know, there's the thing about this whole Trump thing, I mean, it woke us up. I mean, I was like, God, did you, Lord, did you have to do that to wake us up? <laughs> we woke now, we get it. Stop it, make it stop. We, you know, we get it. But the fact of the matter is that it has woken up a lot of people and it has invigorated people and there are organizations out there so many that you can join if you don't want to do things on your own that are actually resisting now. And doing it effectively. I mean, look at what's happening in the courts, right? There have been victories, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's, that's how I sort of not give up hope. That's how I not lose my mind. I stop and take a break when I need to take a break and I urge you to do it. And you don't give up hope because you pick the thing, one thing, if you got strength and energy for two, pick two. But just don't try, don't get to feel overwhelmed by the fact that there's so much. Because there are a lot of people out here who do care about this issue and who are working on it. And together, if we all work on it, you know, we can, we can win. I have to believe that. And if there are not any other questions, yes, there are, okay. I think one more, because I think we have to go out for the book signing. It's almost, so this will probably have to be yes. the last one. Go sure. Ahead. So you have talked a lot about picking your one thing. So I'm curious, one, like how did you pick yours? Did it happen to you or did you seek it out? Um, and if we're still trying to pick, is there one thing that you see that you haven't done you that you wish somebody thing. could do? I'm looking for career advice. Like yeah. anything. Yeah. That's great. Pick my thing. <laughs> Mine is the most important. Well, I've already told. <laughs> I've already told my story about how I ended up picking prosecutors because at my experience at the DC Public Defender Service, I saw some outrageous things and couldn't believe prosecutors were getting away with that. And so that's kind of what inspired me to focus so much on trying to fix, you know, prosecutorial abuse in, in this country. So yeah. um, I'll so, let my comments. So mine was a very profound moment. I've never forgotten to tell people all the time. I was um, a freshman, first semester freshman in undergrad 
And I knew going into undergrad that I wanted to be a lawyer, didn't know quite what I you know, wanted to do in law. Um, and um, my undergrad had a list of apprenticeship opportunities. And the one legal apprenticeship was in the DA's office. And so I went, and on my very first, they've never heard the story. So on my very, <laughs> for one day. <laughs> so I, I literally, I go into, uh, I show up for my apprenticeship, and I go in, um, and I'm sitting, uh, they take me in, and I'm sitting uh, at the council table with the, the DA on the case. And literally, they bring in uh, a string of children, chained together, Shackled together by arms and legs that changed my life. Mm. Changed my life. Where was and that? I lived in Durham, North Carolina. North Carolina. Mm. Yeah. And I, um, I turned to the prosecutor and I immediately said, I want to be at that table with the defense wow. counsel. And she was like, very, she was great about it. Oh, let me introduce you to him. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, there was no way. So that was my aha moment. And then from there, I literally sort of shaped my life around doing something in law around children. Um, and I even chose law schools that had like a clinical program that specialized in kids work. And um, when I got to the law school, um, uh, uh, folks were doing abuse and neglect and they were doing special education advocacy. And I said, but wait, I want to do the deep end kids. I want to do the kids who are in trouble. And um, my professors were great. And they said, well, let's, let's go start picking up some delinquency cases. So yeah, what's your aha moment? What's really grabbing your heart right now? Um, and then if it's not here, ask somebody you know, to, to help you create what's there. So, but do my thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> do my thing. So, so. I'm not going to pitch my thing. Um, what I'm going to suggest instead is, is that you may never have the aha moment. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's and, true. and if you don't, that's OK, too, it right? Is. That sometimes it takes a little bit of time to figure out what it is you care about. And sometimes in really, really, really just serendipitous ways, um, you end up back in the place where you started. Mm -hmm. And only mm -hmm. after you know, 15, 20 years, do you realize, oh my God, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And so if you haven't found the thing yet, that's okay. The, the law is, I think, um, one of the most incredible professions. Um, I am honored to be in this profession every day. And it took me a minute to figure out exactly where I needed to be in it. Um, it, it turned out where I started was where I wanted to be in it. Um, but I didn't always know that. And, and so I think, Give yourself the time and the space to appreciate that if the first job isn't the one you love, yeah. don't give up on the law. Yeah. Do not That's give right. up on the law. Keep pushing through. And if it's not until the fifth or the sixth job that you find the thing that you would get up to do for no money, yeah. that's OK. That yeah. is completely OK. Um, it, there, is, there is so much good to be done in the world. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do it. So give yourself the time to find that. And you all are young. People think, yeah. you know, like, I, yeah, exactly. I talk to my really students know. all the time, and they're like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I was like, you're just 25 right. or, <laughs> or 30, which is, you know, half my age. I'm like, so, and your life will be long, yeah. and so you're probably not going to be doing the same. Mm -hmm. If someone told yeah. me I was going to be a law professor, I would have laughed them out the room. I, I, I did not have a happy law school experience. <laughs> So the notion that I would be a law professor, I would have, I never wanted to be a law professor. I didn't have a good one. So I'm, but I now love being a law professor. I love it. And I never thought I would do that, right? I thought I'd be a public defender forever. So you just never know. Your life is long. You'll, things will happen. And so, you know, just give yourself a chance. You and know? I would add to that, this yeah. notion of remaking yourself, mm -hmm. right? I think yeah. all three of us have remade ourselves a two or three times. times. <laughs> we all talk about it. You know, because we know each other. We remade ourselves two or three times over. And the other thing I think I want to say is that this is a you know, criminal justice panel. Folks came out because they think they might be interested in these policing issues. But we all know how almost every aspect of the law intersects with yes. criminal justice, right? Yes. You know, my immigration folks, my you know, mental health folks. Yeah. Housing, my, oh my God. Housing, yep. you know, education policy, Community it all intersects. Mm -hmm. Social work, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you want to give up on the law thing, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Right? But don't. Um, but <laughs> she teaches here. She has to say that. Um, but you know, but I just want to say that that there's you know the meet, the remaking and the intersections. Mm -hmm. So cool. thank you all very much. We'll be signing books outside, so please join us.